How many of you know who Ira Yates is? Anybody know Ira Yates? Yeah, I didn't know him either until I looked him up. Uh, Ira Yates was a poor uh, West Texas sheep rancher in the Depression era of the 1930s. And uh, his story is a remarkable story. How many of you have heard of Yates Field? One of the top ten largest oil-producing fields in the, in the continental U.S. He had uh, purchased this property in the far west Texas, in, uh, southwest of Midland, Odessa area, if you're familiar with Texas, and was trying to make a living, and it was just kind of hard scrabble, scratching it out, and was really unable to pay his bills. And so when uh, oil ex- kind of prospectors came and asked permission to drill on his property, he agreed. They put one wildcat well on his property in 1934 and drilled down at 500 feet. There was nothing. At 800 feet, nothing. At 1,000 feet, nothing. And they were about to give it up and move on. But at 1,100 feet, they struck oil. That single well was soon pumping out 180,000 gal- barrels of oil a day. And it was one of it, 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 Yates's property became, at the time, the largest oil producing field in all of the U.S. And it, is still pumping out oil to this day. Uh, in the 1960s, after oil had been pumped out for more than 30 continuous years, a government test of just one of those wells showed that it still had a potential flow of 125,000 barrels a day, just one well. In the year 2000, it was still a top 10. Started in 1934, production in 1936, in the year 2000, it's still in the top 10, continuously pumping out oil. Think about the reserve that's there the remarkable size of it. You know, I think many Christians can relate to this story, and here's why. Ira Yates then became instantly, went from being poverty-stricken and almost destitute to an instant millionaire, didn't he? His children became millionaires. His grandchildren became millionaires. His great-grandchildren. It changed the whole course of the Yates family for generations. Here's the question. Was Yates a millionaire before oil was discovered on his property? Was he? Technically, he was. He was sitting on the richest oil reserve in the continental U.S. He just didn't know it. He didn't access it. He didn't live like it. I think many of us live this way. My observation is we don't really know what we have access to. We don't really live in light of all that we've been given. We're starting a new series called Built to Last, and I was reminded that's the name of one of our adult learning communities, and we're not trying to promote one class over the other, uh, but it is appropriate to the book of Ephesians. Very excited about this. I know that I say that all the time, but I really am excited. In fact, reading through Ephesians last, last couple of weeks, just to get a sense of the whole book in preparation for the sermon, I almost felt this overwhelming sense of excitement and joy, but also fear. Like, this is, I'm not sure I can do this justice. It's so incredible. And I think a good nutshell look at the book of Ephesians would be to say, Paul is trying to tell you all you have. What you're sitting on, in other words, in Christ. All you have access to. And for many of us, we live as if we're poor dirt farmers, spiritually speaking. When we're beyond billionaires in Christ, is what he's telling us. Let's open up to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read the first 14 verses of chapter 1. And, and, I, and th- I'm not exaggerating when I said, when I read through this, I thought, there could be two sermons per verse easily. And we're going to cram these 14 into one sermon. Maybe that's why I got anxious. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, And making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, 
having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. I feel like I should read that again and again, and maybe we just should just have it read over us the whole morning. Because I, I, I really do tremble at trying to, trying to unpack this. It's just so beautiful and so powerful. The cultural context here will help us, I think, understand a little bit of what Paul's writing, who he's writing to. I mentioned the Apostle Paul is the author. He's writing to the saints in Ephesus, Christians in Ephesus, the ancient city in Ephesus in modern-day Turkey. Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the world at the time of Paul's writing. You'll see it here. It was uh, on, the, it, on the coast of the Aegean Sea. Fourth largest city in the Roman world at the time of Paul's writing. It's a key city connecting east and west, Asia with the Mediterranean world of the Roman Empire. It was a wealthy city. It was really, a, 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 and in fact, it became a staging ground for Paul's missionary and ministry. You can leave that up there if you don't mind. Uh, to Asia the surrounding area. In fact, many people think this letter to Ephesus was not just written to the city of Ephesus, but written to the Asia Minor, the surrounding area. The letter would be circulated from Ephesus and beyond. In fact, in ancient Ephesus, the city itself is a remarkable place. Uh, some of you may have read about this or, or even had the, the privilege to travel there. It's one of the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. It's a key city, not just in the Greco-Roman world, but a key city in the story of the birth of the church. You'll see an image here of the theater. The great theater in Ephesus, this is it, only partially restored. I mean, it's remarkably well preserved. Sat 25,000 people. Think about that. 25,000. No amplification. No microphones. No sound system. Just a remarkable piece of engineering and construction. And you can still visit it today. Have you ever wondered what, why, some of you might have called this an amphitheater. It's not. Uh, I found this out. We traveled to Israel. I always call this an amphitheater and a theater the whole thing. Actually, amphi is the, is the Greek word for around. The, I mean, the Roman word for around. So an amphitheater is the whole thing. A theater is only half of it. I didn't know that. Maybe you, di maybe you did, but now you, if you didn't, now you're like me and you know. That's the theater, not the amphitheater. It's a remarkable place. A wealthy cosmopolitan city. Ephesus was also the center of the Roman world for the cult of the Roman goddess Diana, or in Greek, Artemis. The temple of Artemis was four times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. Huge. You know what's left of it today? Just this. A field of rubble and one reconstructed pillar. It was this massive temple. It dominated the economic landscape of, of Ephesus. It dominated the cultural landscape, the religious landscape. It was the center, the pride of the city. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, when Paul visits Ephesus, there's a riot that breaks out because people are being converted to Christianity and giving up some of their pagan practices and selling up these silver statues of Artemis, and it threatens the economy, and so they riot, screaming, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, but the story of how the church began there actually predates Paul. In Acts chapter 18, we're told that a Jewish man from Alexandria named Apollos is the first to go and preach the gospel in this city. But he only knows of John the Baptist's baptism, that baptism of repentance, but not of new life. He's preaching the message of Jesus, but it's somewhat incomplete. Priscilla and Aquila, you might know them from the New Testament. I know there's a lot of names here for you that are not familiar. They get a hold of Apollos and instruct him in what was called at the time the way, following Jesus, the Christian life. And Apollos begins to teach. And some people are converted to becoming disciples of Jesus in Ephesus under Apollos' teaching. Only about a dozen. In Acts 19, Paul makes his way to Ephesus. And he meets with these 12 disciples, these early disciples followers in Ephesus that have been, had their hearts changed by Apollos' preaching and the message of the gospel. He begins to teach them and instruct them and disciple them. He spends two and a half to three years in this city, preaching in synagogues, in the agora, in the marketplace, in the streets, building and establishing the elders and the church as like a staging ground for the rest of his ministry in Asia Minor. 
In fact, in Acts chapter 20, there's this beautifully touching farewell of Paul to the Ephesian elders. It's very personal and intimate. So when he writes this letter to the Ephesians, this is who he's writing to. People that were converted under the preaching of another man, Apollos, but for whom Paul instructed and taught and led and trained and developed and established the church. He knows them. He loves them. And now he's writing to them. So this is the city and the context in which Paul writes. And the structure of the letter is really important. I listened to a sermon by Alistair Begg on the intro introduction of the book of Ephesians, and he said we need to get the geography of the gospel right. I like that phrase, geography of the gospel. What he means by that is even in the way the letter is laid out, we learn something about how the gospel works. Because Ephesians is most known for Ephesians chapter 6, there's spiritual warfare, right? We read about in there. Uh, and we, in Ephesians 5, wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters. So there's a lot of practical things about how to pray, how to live, how to work, how to love, how to serve. But that's all at the end of the book. The first three chapters, Paul talks about none of that. He talks exclusively about this phrase called in him, in Christ over and over again. In other words, the first three chapters are all about what God has done. And then the last three chapters are about what we should do in response to it. That's the geography of the gospel. The order and the sequence is so important. He doesn't begin with all the things we ought to be doing. He begins with, what has God done? And what does that mean for you? What has he established for you? What has he given you access to? Who are you now? And then out of that foundational understanding, Here's how you live as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother, as a son, as a daughter, as a child. But only when you get this in him understanding right first. Even the Greek verbs, if you read through the Greek, um, the verbs in the first three chapters are almost all indicative. And the verbs in the last three chapters are almost all imperative. Even the way Paul talks about it, he talks about it in terms of this is who you are, this is what you should do. Many of us flip it around, don't we? This is what I ought to do so that I could have some standing with God. But Paul doesn't talk about it that way. The how only comes after the who. He only talks about who we are to be as husbands, wives, sons, daughters, after he establishes who we are in Christ. Now, uh, verses 13 through 14 of chapter 1 is the longest continuous Greek sentence in the New Testament. It's one giant run-on run sentence in Greek. There's no, like, breaks. I, I remember because I struggled in Greek and I had to diagram the sentence when I, in my class and I realized this is long. It's as if Paul just got going and he just couldn't stop. He just got going talking about what Christ has done and who we are in him and he just couldn't stop himself. And he just went on and on and on because everything it modifies everything else that comes before it. Now look at verse 1. Let's just take verse 1 for a minute. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. I don't know if you can see that up there. I want you to pay attention to three, word, three phrases here. The first one is the word saints. To the saints who are in Ephesus. Who are the saints? Who are saints? They're not from New Orleans. I spoke at a uh, chapel when the saints were in town to play the Bears. I spoke to the saints one time. They're huge, the saints. <laughs> Who are the saints Paul's writing to? Right. You know the answer, but do you live that way? Do you think of yourself that way? The answer is not canonized people who have, who have been established by the institutional church of Rome. They didn't exist yet. They're not super Christians. They're not super spiritual who have done something to like deserve this status. Who's Paul? Remember the, remember the context here. Who's he writing to? I know you. I taught you. I trained you. I led you to faith in Christ. I built you up. We, I knew you when, right? You're the saints. Well, who would be the saints today in our context? If you're here and you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ and surrendered your life to him, you are a saint. Turn to your neighbor and say, hello, saint. <laughs> Don't laugh. Say it. It's awkward, isn't it? You don't think of yourself this way. 
But this spiritually, most of us think of ourselves as sinners, screw-ups, who God's been gracious to. Now, I'm not perfect. I'm kind of a sinner, but, you know, God, the truth is, if you're in Christ, the Bible says you're not a sinner, you're a saint. You're a redeemed of God. You're his child, his son, his daughter, his heir. We'll get to all of that. This, right off the bat, this is astounding stuff to the saints. And notice these two other phrases. We can go back to verse 1, sorry. In Ephesus and in Christ Jesus. Now, the phrase in him, in Christ, is going to come up over and over and over again in the first couple of chapters. But I want you to see the juxtaposition of these two phrases, in Ephesus and in Christ Jesus. It's as if Paul is saying, there's two locations for you who are saints. You have a, a, a physical geography. You're in the city of Ephesus, but you're also in Christ. In other words, your heavenly geography, your spiritual identity being in Christ, how does that inform how you live in Ephesus or in Geneva or in St. Charles or in Batavia or in Elburn or wherever, right? In other words, your position in Christ, it should inform your life in the Tri-Cities, in the United States. That's what he's getting at. First thing I, I want to point out here, well, that's the first thing. We've pointed out several things already. But the first point is chosen by the Father. The first thing about this being in Christ that Paul wants to highlight is we are chosen by the Father. Let me read to you verses 4 through 6 and then 11 through 12. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Oh, just those three verses in verses 11 through 12. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. This idea of being chosen by God is foundational to understanding what it means to be in Christ. He chose you. Now, in the, in the ancient Greek, Greco-Roman world, it was a common practice for infants that were born deformed, sickly, or just plain unwanted to be, uh, the practice was called uh, exposti, meaning exposure. To leave your child outside the city on a particular hillside to die of exposure. Just to die. Leave the infant. This was not uncommon. Infanticide really is what it was. The early Christians in the Greco-Roman world and in Ephesus, there's historical accounts that are outside the Bible of this, they didn't protest this practice like Christians sometimes protest abortion today, which is, there's nothing wrong with protesting. I think abortion is a great evil in the world. But what they did was they adopted these children. They went out to those hillsides outside the city, found them, brought them home, and raised them as their own son or daughter. This was shocking behavior in the ancient world. This is an unwanted child for a reason. These early believers in Christ, because they believed that all men and women, regardless of age, gender, race, or made in the image of God, went to claim them the way that Christ had claimed them and adopt them, and raise them as their own. Verse 4, he says that we should be blameless and holy in his sight. The word blameless means without defect. These children were left out because they were defective. They were deformed. They were sickly. They were something wrong with them. In verse 5, we are adopted as sons. In verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance. Paul's clearly talking about a cultural pra practice here in their culture. To the Greek worldview, imperfections meant a divine curse. Divine displeasure, at least. But to God, imperfect, sinful people are not objects of displeasure, but his love and his affection. They're worth going outside the city to a hillside to rescue, to claim as his own sons and daughters, to bring into his family, to raise as his own. Paul says to the Ephesians, God's not like the Greeks. It's not like your culture. He's utterly different. 
He loves you. He's the God who climbed the hillside to find you. When you were, we're going to get to this in chapter 2, verse 1, when you were dead in your sins, right, left to die, totally helpless, like an infant on a hillside. What could you do to save yourself? You're going to die. In fact, you're as good as dead, spiritually speaking. But that's how God is. He would claim you and adopt you. He doesn't look over and pick the best. This one is worthy. He finds the ones no one wants. Now, it's easy to apply that to somebody else. I want you to think about that's you. If you're in Christ, that's you. I feel like what God was saying to me is, that's you, Jeff. That's you. I, I can believe this for other people. It, it, easier than I can believe it for myself sometimes. I can worship this and praise this for, for you easier than I can for me. Do you hear that this morning? You're, spiritually speaking, like an unwanted infant left on a hillside. Dead, as good as dead. And God goes and finds you and rescues you and adopts you, chooses you. It's just, amen indeed. Now I know, when we talk about being chosen, some people get stuck here. You think, well, wait a minute, didn't I choose God? Didn't I choose to trust him? Didn't I choose to, to follow him? Yes, yes, indeed you did but only because he chose you. What does verse 4 say? Before the foundation of the world. How could you have chosen him before that? He's first, right? I'm first. We always, when we were kids, we'd fight about this, right? There's no question here. God's choosing comes first in the gospel. If you have chosen him, it's because he's wooing you and drawing you and he's already chosen you. And I think some of you have heard about the doctrine of election. Who's heard that phrase, the doctrine of election? or predestination. Some of you get excited, some of you get nervous right now, right? Now listen, brilliant, godly men and women have debated this for centuries, but I think I figured it out and could talk to you about it right here this morning. <laughs> I did all the Greek study about the word chosen, and the word chosen, what it really means is chosen. <laughs> In all seriousness, this is a, a, a bit of a mystery. Human responsibility and divine sovereignty. How can I choose God if he chose me, if I've already been chosen? How do those things go together? If I've already been chosen, am I free to choose? But if I'm the one who chooses, does that mean that God is waiting on me? Let me read to you what J.I. Packer writes about this in the introduction to his book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. He's wrestled with the question, well, why even share the gospel if God just decides before the foundation of the world? If he already knows and chooses, what are we, why? What are we involved in? Here's what he says. He says, when you uh, compare, when you put together God's ultimate and supreme sovereignty, which is undeniable in Scripture, and man's human responsibility, relative freedom, as it were, those things together are what he calls an antimony, A-I-A-N-T-I-M-O-N-Y. Uh, maybe it's an antimony. I don't know how to pronounce it. He says, it's a term that comes from Mathematics. Meaning, you observe in the physical universe, or in mathematical science, two things that are provable and observable on their own, but you cannot mathematically reconcile them together. By the way, this was the theory of relativity during Einstein's life. He never could, he fudged the numbers because he couldn't quite prove it. But he, he observed it. He knew they were there. When we come to the, the Word of God, it's our supreme authority. I don't stand over the Word. The Word is over me. And when I read the Word with an open mind and heart, clearly God is sovereign over all things. And, at the same time, man is a responsible moral agent. I cannot deny one for the other. If I do, I do damage to the Word of God, and I misunderstand who He is and who I am. I have to accept them both, even though I cannot reconcile them perfectly in my mind, my finite human mind. A paradox is something that sounds like a contradiction until you get it. Like when Jesus says, the first shall be last. Huh? And then you realize, oh, he's talking about humility and putting others first. I get it now. But an antimo antimony is something that looks like a contradiction and you never quite come to the paradoxical understanding. Yet I have to hold them both. And I think when you come right down to it, that's what we have here. When Paul says he predestined you to be adopted as sons before the foundation of the world, that's what he's saying. God chose you. You didn't choose him. Yet, you're a responsible moral agent. 
How? I don't know, but they're both there. Let me read what he says. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are taught to us side by side in the same Bible. Indeed, sometimes in the same text. Both are thus guaranteed to us by the same divine authority. Both, therefore, are true. It follows, then, that they must be held together and not played off against each other. To our finite minds, of course, this is inexplicable. It sounds like a contradiction, and our reaction at first is to complain that it is absurd. We like to tie everything up into neat intellectual parcels, with all appearance of mystery dispelled and no loose ends hanging out. The antimony which we now face is only one of a number that the Bible presents to us. We may be sure they all find their reconciliation in the mind and the counsel of God, and we may hope that in heaven we shall understand them ourselves. But meanwhile, our wisdom and our calling is to maintain with equal emphasis both the apparent conflicting truths. On our feet, he says, we may disagree, but on our knees we are all assured and agreed. God is God. That's been helpful to me. But the beautiful message and an important thing for you this morning is this. The truth of the gospel and the doctrine of election is that if you are in Christ, it's because God chose you. Not by, because of anything you did. Not because you earned it even by your own choice. Because that's who God is. He is loving and he is gracious and he chose you. Second, which goes right after the first, chosen by God then redeemed by the Son. Redeemed by the Son. Redeem means, <clears throat> excuse me, to buy back, to purchase. It's deliverance by, by payment of a price. Just yesterday, I sat in the back couple of rows there with my wife for the memorial service of Al Cruz. Some of you were there, or know Al. Longtime member of our church, and then went when we planted Valley Brook Church a number of years ago. And during the course of his memorial service, one of his sons, Ted, stood right here and talked about the story of when Aaron, Al's daughter, who works on our staff, adopted their first child, Lauren, and how they had prayed and prayed for a child and decided to adopt, and when it came right down to it, they couldn't afford it. And Al said, borrow whatever you need from me. Let's get this done. And so they did. And then at Christmas, uh, the first Christmas with Lauren as their baby girl adopted into their family, he gave a made-up, handwritten little receipt to Aaron and John Wise. And on the, <laughs> on the receipt, it said, All debts paid in full, little Lauren is yours. You know, I was sitting there thinking about Ephesians. All debts paid, she's yours. When Paul says, we are chosen by God, redeemed by by his blood, adopted as sons and daughters. That's what he's saying. All paid. You belong to me. You're mine. Let me clear my eyes and read Ephesians 1, 7 through 9. I can't see anyway now. I, I, this is a mess. <laughs> All right. In him we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood. You see adoption goes with redemption. Being chosen and adopted comes at a price. But it's not a price we pay because we can't. It's a price paid for us. For Paul, the salvation we have in Christ is so incredible, it's so overwhelming, it's so inexplicable that there's no one metaphor or image that can contain it all. That's why you see in this passage redemption and reconciliation and adoption and forgiveness, and, and it's all like they're all overlapping and interconnecting, and that's why it's all one run-on sentence, because it's just almost beyond our ability to comprehend or explain. But yet we need to try, because we're sitting on this this limitless supply. Do you like, I love that phrase. According to his, his, the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. Lavishing on us. In this case, Paul's saying that our adoption has been chosen, purchased. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul says, verse 7, if you're no longer a slave, you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. 
In the ancient Greco-Roman world, slaves could become uh, sons and heirs, and it sometimes would happen, but it was, there was a price to be paid. It had to be purchased. Notice also, Paul says, we have redemption. Did you catch that? Not we hope for it, we long for it, or someday it will come true, like wishing upon a star, right? My prince will come someday or something like that. It's not like I'm hoping someday this, this works out. He's saying, in Christ, you have redemption. You have it. You have been redeemed. It's not a future hope. It's a present reality. You might not be living like it. You might doubt it. You might forget it. But in Christ, you have redemption. You've been redeemed. Think, I mean, all debts paid in full. Chosen adopted, redeemed according to his grace which he lavishes upon us. So it's not, what I, li I like about this is like, it's not like, I'm, no, it's going to cost X amount to, to redeem you and I'm only paying that much. Just the minimum I can get by with. God's not haggling over the cost of your redemption. Like, I mean, let me barter it down to the, the least I can get by with here. How far is God willing to go? How much is the Father willing to pay? All of it and more. He, it's, he lavishes it upon you. All the way to the cross, all the way to the giving of his Son. We've been redeemed by his blood. It's, the Greek word is epikorygia. It means like uh, it, to, to extravagant pouring out. Kind of like when the woman is pouring out uh, expensive perfume on Jesus and the disciples, whoa, whoa, we can sell that and give to the poor. And Jesus goes, she's doing the right thing. Extravagant devotion, the way he pours out his grace on our lives. It's a picture of a father who's just full of joy to just be generous to his kids. Just can't wait to be gracious to them. At my daughter's game, uh, last night basketball game, her college game, one of her old high school assistant coaches came to the game. And I thanked him for coming. He sat with us, and he, said, he showed me a picture on his phone. His twin grandchildren, little boy and little girl, just born recently. He said, this is going to be my last year coaching. And I said, why? He goes, I just don't want to miss a thing. We live right down the street. I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to miss any of it. I can't wait to be grandpa to them. And I know what he's talking about, to lavish them with his love, with love and with grace and just pour it out on them because you're just, they're, they're so precious to you. Do you think of yourself that way in God's eyes? I mean, if it's true that it cost the cross to redeem you, don't you think you're of infinite value to God? Do you think he's just disinterested in your life? Do you think he's like, yeah, I got plenty. What's one more in here or there? No, you're, his, you're a son, you're a daughter, you're just precious to him. Because the price that was paid for you. Now also notice that Paul connects the riches of God's grace lavished upon us with wisdom, insight, and knowledge of God's will. This was curious to me when I first read this and started paying attention to it. I, it's just an interesting connection, a really profound one. Uh, let, me, let me read it to you again. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So he talks about we've been adopted and redeemed by the grace of God, which is lavished on us. And by the way, that gives you knowledge and insight into who God is and what he's doing in the world. In other words, the knowledge of God's will is not a detached academic exercise. It's not purely theological study. You know who God is and what he's doing best by tasting and seeing how good he is. The best way you know what God is like and what he's doing is the experience of his grace. C.S. Lewis once wrote, a boy in love knows more about the workings of the universe than any astronomer. What's he saying? Behind the universe is love, in other words. You want to know what God is like and what his will is? It's not detached study. It's experience of his grace lavished upon you. I, I've talked to people as a pastor who, prior to coming to faith in Christ, they... These things like election and redemption and adoption are, you know, don't make sense to them. And then afterwards, it's like, well, who rewrote the Bible? All of a sudden, this comes alive to me. Why? It's the knowledge of his purpose and will is revealed by the experience of his grace. 
That's how we understand that God's bringing all things together in Christ, including you and me. Last, sealed by the Spirit. I hope by now you're noticing the Trinitarian working here that Paul's giving us. That the whole counsel, the full Godhead is at work in, in giving you all that you have in Christ. Chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, sealed by the Spirit. Let me read verses 13 and 14 again. In him all, you also, when you heard the word of the truth of the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. That phrase, the praise of his glory, is repeated over and over again, isn't it, in this one long run-on sentence. It's all about the praise of the glory of God. The Holy Spirit is, is, there's three words. If you're a highlighter or underliner, Ephesians is going to be fun for you. You're going to mark up your Bible like crazy. If not, then get a journal and write this down somewhere else. But notice about the Holy Spirit, three words. Promised, seal, and guarantee. Those three words are critical to understanding the role of the Holy Spirit in this context. Now, by the way, after Easter, we're going to launch into a nine-week series on the Holy Spirit. Who he, who he is, what he does, how he works in the church, in our lives, and so we're excited about that. But for now, Paul's saying the role of the Holy Spirit here, the primary role is that he is a promise, he's promised, he's a seal, and he's a guarantee. Let's talk about what those things mean in turn, at least in brief. The Holy Spirit is promised. In the Old Testament prophet Joel, in the book of Ezekiel, we see over and over again God's promise of his spirit, although it's a little bit, we don't understand perfectly what that means yet. And then Jesus himself in John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18, says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you a helper to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. See how he puts the Spirit together with this idea of I'm not leaving you as orphans, with adoption, the Spirit of adoption. So the first part of the Spirit is it's promised. In the Old Testament and by Jesus himself. Paul's saying, that's now come true. And by the way, this is a little bit of a side, and we only have four minutes left, but uh, I'll talk fast. When, when Paul comes in Acts 19 to the people in Ephesus, the believers, he says, do you have, you, do you have the Spirit? And they say, well, we haven't even heard about the Spirit, because they only know John's baptism. And he says, oh, let me tell you about the Spirit. He's not talking about the second blessing or second baptism where people get off the rails when it comes to uh, the theology of the Spirit. He's saying about this, the Spirit that testifies in our spirit that we are children of God. We belong to Him. The assurance, the security. So first promise. Second thing, sealed. When Paul uses the term sealed, he's telling us that God has put his mark on us or in us. Now, in the ancient world, the word seal he uses here is the Greek word sphragizo. It was used for the signet ring, pressed into wax on a, on a scroll or an official document that would give it uh, authenticity and authority. He's saying God has, the spirit in you is like God impressing himself into your life. The mark of authority and authenticity. Here's how you know you belong to him. He's giving you his spirit. It's a seal. So you would know. Now, in the ancient world, the seal was external, right? For the world to see. So that the two parties would know, oh, this is official. I see, this. I see the seal. But the spirit is internal, isn't it? Who's the spirit for? Who's the, who's the spirit for? You. It's not for me to examine you. Oh, I don't think you have the spirit. Too many Christians do this. It's so that you would know in your heart, I belong to him. I belong to him. He has chosen me. He has redeemed me. He has claimed me. The Spirit testifies in my spirit that I, I am a child of God. It's for you to know, for your security, for your assurance. He has put his Spirit in you so you will know you're his. That you belong to him. Paul says in Romans 8, 16, I've been quoting it, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Finally, the guarantee. The guarantee of what's to come. When my wife and I bought our first house, we lived in a little tiny apartment in Algonquin, Illinois, or actually Lake in the Hills, right on the verge of, outside of Algonquin. My wife wanted to buy a house. We didn't have any money. I'm like, I don't think we're going to find a house. But she was, you know, I've learned that when she decides, we're probably going to buy a house. She started looking for a house and found a little two-bedroom tiny ranch in, outside of Crystal Lake. And I worked at Willow Creek Community Church at the time, a little, little, just a, a little tiny house. But, you know, we didn't have any children yet, and we were excited about that, and, and our first home. And she went, and uh, 
met her, her mother uh, put us in touch with a realtor in the area. We met with a realtor. We talked about it. I didn't know. I knew that it was supposed to be a down, a down payment, a deposit, you know, and I thought, well, we could scrape something together. My folks are going to help us. We're going to buy our first house. When we went to the, uh, to the first con the contract signing, not the closing, but the contract, I, I didn't know about earnest money. I mean, I didn't know the difference between earnest money and, and, the, and the down payment. I thought, you know, you wait till the closing, you give the down payment. So I was working on st still getting that together. I didn't know you have to give some of it up front of the earnest money thing. Can you just take my word for it? I'm good for it. We really, really want this house. Trust me. No, no. There's some earnest money required up front, which will be applied to the down payment, right? But you got to pay it now. Why? It's a guarantee. It's telling me that you're going to make good on your promise to buy this house. Paul's saying that's the Spirit. It's the first fruits of what God's going to do in you. It's how you know that you really are going to be with him forever, that your life really is redeemed, that you really do belong, that he will make good on his promises. I'm giving you a taste. I'm giving you the spirit of what's to come. The spirit is the deposit, the down payment. Some of your Bibles might even say the, 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 the deposit. Specifically, that's what Paul's saying. It was promised from the beginning, even by Jesus himself. It's the seal, so that in your heart you'll know. And it's the guarantee of what's to come. Meaning, it's just a taste. You're going to get so much more. There's really only one way to respond to all this, isn't there? I fear that I haven't done this justice. I hope you'll go and read this and pray about this and ask God to speak to your heart about this, this amazing truth in these 14 verses. There's really only one way to respond to this. And Paul says it over and over again in his passage, to the praise of his glory the praise of his glory. I think most of you are here and you're in Christ. You are in Christ, but perhaps you're like Ira Yates. You're sitting on the richest reserve you could possibly imagine, but you just aren't living like it. You aren't accessing it. You don't live each day as if I'm redeemed, I'm adopted, I'm chosen. I have an inheritance. I belong to him. I've been sealed. I've been guaranteed. Some of you might be here and You've been around church for a while, but maybe you aren't in him. Maybe you've never made that decision. Maybe right now you realize, is God calling me in this moment? Is he making known his choice to redeem my life? All of it to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father God, we pause and acknowledge that we, we barely scratch the surface of these remarkable truths. But when we settle our minds and hearts long enough to reflect on the fact that you would pursue us and choose us, broken and sinful as we are, claim us as your own, pay the price of our redemption through the gift of your Son and his death on the cross, and then give us your Spirit, the impress of your Spirit, in our hearts to assure us and to guarantee that we belong to you. We can hardly believe it, but we want to live our lives, as Paul tells us, to the praise of your glory. In your name, amen.